Podcaster's Guide to the Conspiracy, brought to you today by Josh Edison and Dr. M. Denton. Hello and welcome to the Podcaster's Guide to the Conspiracy. I am... Jo- what the heck is that? That's my whiskey glass. That was a whiskey glass. I, without a whiskey glass... I'm Josh Edison, sitting uh, in Auckland, New Zealand. The bearer of the whiskey glass is, of course, Dr. M. Dentith, uh, sitting in Hamilton, New Zealand. Far... I think you're we'll fine, Josh. We want to call it Kiri Kiri Roa now. Oh, yes, yes, we are. Yeah, there's been, uh, we, we've been doing a bit of uh, pulling down. Well, actually, we haven't. What did they do to the statue? They didn't pull it down. Have they taken it away yet? They have. It, it has been sort of, removed. It's been picked up and taken off. Um, because Major it turns Hamilton, out... Major Hamilton has left the city. Mm. Turns out um, the city of Hamilton in New Zealand is named after a, a Major Hamilton who never went to Hamilton, I understand, and basically got himself killed in sharp order uh, fighting against the Maori. Yeah, so basically his only claim to fame was massacring the indigenous people of this place, and for that he got a, a city named city after him. Named after him. Mm. And the reckoning has been maybe that was always a bad idea. Yes, yeah, so Kiri Kiri Roa is the uh, is, is 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 possibly the name you should be using. I think I, I really wish um, it were more like um, in Australia, where the city of Melbourne was originally called Batmania, after a Mr. Batman. And frankly, I don't care how many people he massacred. His name was Batman, and he got to name the city Batmania. And the thing is, he massacred a lot of people. I, I, I would not doubt that for a second, actually, although I know nothing of the man. He was a very, 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 very bad man. Right. Probably why they changed it to Melbourne, I suppose. And that means I'm not going to do the thing you love the most, which is my Christian... Christian Bale Batman voice impression. Good. So it would be wrong to elevate Batman to the position of Batman. Batman. Hmm. Uh, now, it is in... No, 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 this is the perfect time for you to, to, to say, talking about Australians... To, well, it's, uh, we are talking about Australians. We are, yes. Uh, talking about Australians... Uh, it's another episode of Conspiracy Theory Masterpiece Theatre, and this week we're going to be looking at Conspiracy Theories and Conspiracy Theorising by Steve Clark of Charles Sturt University, who I am given to understand is of the Australian persuasion. He is of the Australian persuasion, and that is not a euphemism. Hmm. That is literally true. Shall we play the chime and then go into the, I was to say the full boner of the episode? I have a feeling there's going to be a lot of accidental Australianisms in the course of the recording of this episode, and for that, we can only apologise. But yes, play the chime. So, Conspiracy Theories and Conspiracy Theorising by Steve Clark, published in the Philosophy of the Social Sciences, volume 32, number 2, June 2002. So, just after 9-11. Our first actual post-9-11 um paper. But no uh, actual mention of no, 9-11 in the paper, because the way that these things work, it was published in June of 2002, but it was probably submitted back in 2001. It probably went into pre-production and proofing halfway through the year prior, and thus Steve probably wrote it not knowing 9-11 was about to come, which once again mm. makes us ask, what are these people doing if they can't predict terrorist events of this particular scale? And even then, I mean, I, I don't know if we've ever really looked into the timeline of it, but the actual, the, the 9-11 conspiracy theories didn't really get going in earnest until after the Loose Change documentary, did they? I mean, they were obviously yeah, there were some around right from the start, but anyway. Anyway, um, so Philosophy of the Social Sciences of Memory Serves is the journal that Charles Pigden's of, um, Popper Revisited was published in. Correct. I think, yes. So, uh, and while this paper mentions Popper Revisited once that I s- spotted, it seems to be mostly another response to Brian L. Keeley's of Conspiracy Theories. Yes, um, it's true that Steve mentions Charles's paper, interestingly enough, doesn't mention Lee's paper at all. I have a theory about this. I actually, I could, I could, I could check this because I know 
I know Steve, so I actually could have emailed him about this. My suspicion is that there's actually not enough time between Lee's publication and Steve's publication for either Steve to have read it or Steve to have updated his paper if he had read it, mm. to include mention of it in this new paper. So they're, they're not strictly contemporaneous, but, but close in enough. philosophical publication terms, they're basically published at exactly the same time. Mm. Uh, so before we proceed, um, who is Steve Clark? Give us a bit of a bio. So Steve Clark is a philosopher at Charles Sturt University. He's also associated with Oxford as well. I first met Steve back in 2016 at the conspiracy theory workshop that Pat Stokes organized. We hit it off there. Steve and I actually were working on a proposal to look at COVID-19 conspiracy theories in Australia, which we were hoping to get funded through Charles Sturt University. That proposal did not go ahead, but we're still keeping in mind other places that we could get funding from. So Steve is someone who I have technically worked with in the past, working on a funding proposal, hopefully working with in the future. And as such, that may well color the kind of commentary we have in this paper for reasons we'll get to at the very end of the discussion of this particular piece, conspiracy theories and conspiracy theorizing. But first, we should probably read the abstract. Joshua, we should like to use your most dulcet tones to tell us how this abstract actually goes. Very well. Did this <clears throat> How about, I, how about I stutter on the very first uh, sentence there? Well, I do, I, I do it all the time. Indeed. The dismissive attitude of intellectuals toward conspiracy theorists is considered and given some justification. It is argued that intellectuals are entitled to an attitude of prima facie scepticism toward the theories propounded by conspiracy theorists because conspiracy theorists have an irrational tendency to continue to believe in conspiracy theories even when these take on the appearance of forming the core of a degenerating research program. It's further argued that, that the pervasive effect of the fundamental attribution era can explain the behaviour of such conspiracy theorists. A rival approach due to Brian Keeley, which involves the criticism of a subclass of conspiracy theories on epistemic grounds, is considered and found to be inadequate. Bravo, sir. Bravo. Mm. Well, read. well read. Now, I would like to point out, before we actually get into the meat and potato, apparently there's only one bit of meat and only mm. one potato there. Obviously. He does state at the very end of this paper a comment which, in today's political climate and today's climate of conspiracy theorizing, does seem a bit ridiculous. Most conspiracy theorists who manage to make the headlines these days produce theories which are harebrained and lacking in warrant, but few are actually harmful. That's on page 148. I think it kind of shows that in the last 18 years, things have changed an awful lot. Mm. Yes, actually, I would be interested to see how, how s simple changes in world events have... Um modified people's theories when it comes to especially if your theory is based on the idea that conspiracy theories are are, are quite niche and quite uh, unsubstantial but anyway let's get into it so um this the, this one this one rubbed me the wrong way right from the start when it, it talks about um conspiracy theorists in the same breath as creationists and astrologers um, although he does, of course, point out uh, equally quickly that conspiracies have consistently taken place throughout history. So he does, it does at least say that, well, okay, conspiracy theories are, uh, at least um, some of them have been proved to be right. Now, I think what's going on here is that Steve is doing a bit of a rhetorical flourish here. So he is kind of tilting towards the audience that goes, oh, conspiracy theories are ridiculous. You know, it's like weird science or pseudoscience. So... He initially goes, well, look, in the same breath, we can talk about X and Y. But then he goes, but the thing about conspiracy theories, as opposed to creationism or astrology, is that conspiracy theories have a track record. And he uses a cricket metaphor to describe the fact that actually conspiracy theories have turned out to be true in the past. What he really wants to do is make an association between populism and anti-intellectualism. And go, look, the problem isn't really that we associate conspiracy theories with 
things like creationism or astrology. The problem is that conspiracy theorizing has, and I quote, long been favored by populists who are almost invariably anti-elitist and therefore generally anti-intellectual as well. Some intellectuals may dismiss conspiracy theories simply on the basis of guilt by association with anti-intellectual populism. So, yeah, that, that first section to me seemed a little bit disconnected from the rest of the paper, but is he just sort of setting the board there, just, just looking at a, a reason for the antipathy toward conspiracy theories before he starts looking into it? Yes, and I think that's in part because we're going back to 2002. Mm. There aren't really many papers out at the stage proposing that we should believe conspiracy theories at all, the common wisdom or the common superstition, is that actually these theories are mad, bad, and dangerous. So Steve is luring his audience in with guilt by association and then going, actually, we should probably look at whether this guilt by association actually has any legs, any legs, any legs to stand on. Mm. Um, so Steve goes on to, uh, so he, he, he does say, and quoting again, I will not argue that intellectuals are entitled to arrogantly dismiss all conspiracy theories, but I will argue there is an entitlement to an attitude of prima facie scepticism towards the theories propounded by conspiracy theorists. Um, so again, yes. Yeah, so, so he's not saying he's not saying uh, we're just we're, we're justified in completely discounting conspiracy theories, but that we are justified in being sceptical towards them, just just uh, in general. Um, and then, as as an introduction to things that will come on, he he, he brings up Brian L. Keeley's paper, uh, which we've looked at before, and um, and, and as we will see, he he. Um, he thinks that the problem is not uh, the, the the problem is not that you should be um, picking at the conspiracy theories themselves. You should be looking at the conspiracy theorists behind them. Um, and you have a note that you think he gets something slightly wrong there. So I am continuing on with my crusade of the argument that people have got Brian wrong on of conspiracy theories. So. I think I got him wrong, I think Lee got him wrong, and I think Steve gets him wrong. I think Steve gets him wrong for a really interesting reason we'll get into when we get to that particular part of the paper. But basically, we all took the wrong tack on Brian discussing mature, unwarranted conspiracy theories, because we took his discussion in the last section to be a kind of generalist project, when actually in the last section, as Steve points out, what Brian is talking about is the attitude of particular conspiracy theorists who believe in these mature, unwarranted conspiracy theories, i.e. conspiracy theories which aren't satisfied by the evidence, but have persisted in discourse nonetheless, like a mature cheese has a stench which continues to persist no matter what you do with it. So I do think Steve gets Brian wrong, but I also think he gets Brian wrong for a really interesting reason as we're going to see. Mm. So let's move on to section two, which is titled Epistemological Problems, and actually look at the way in which he talks about the epistemology of conspiracy theory. Mm. So his, his concern throughout the section seems to be why do conspiracy theorists stick to their beliefs? There's, there seems to be less of a concern about why do they come up with these theories in the first place as why do they cling to them so tenaciously. Um, he talks about, uh, as, as Keeley did before him, um, Steve, I don't even know, I, I want to call him Clark, but then that sounds like a first name, so I'm going with Steve so we know who we talk about, but um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't wish to appear disrespectful to a person of academia. Nevertheless, but Steve? He's also, also a person of academia from Australasia, so we're a we are, we are less formal here, yeah. aren't we? Yeah. Yeah. So Steve, uh, as Brian does before him, Steve um, talks about uh, Hume and his work on miracles and sort of draws the analogy, want to talk about conspiracy theories, kind of how Hume dealt with miracles. Um, again, again, there was a little bit of 
uh, rubbing the wrong way with me when he uh, starts talking about the conspiracy theory of whether or not Elvis is dead and refers to uh, Gail Brewer, Giorgio, the author of Is Elvis Alive? as a typical conspiracy theorist, and I thought, you know, straight away going, going for the weird ones and saying that's typical. But I don't, again, it was 2002. That was a different time. Um, but he also points out that many of the people who complain about conspiracy theories don't seem to know much about actual conspiracy theorists. So, I mean, as he points out, while it is plausible to hold that there are people who are emotionally attracted to believe in conspiracy theories, anyone who concluded that because of these feelings, conspiracy theorists would go on believing in conspiracy theories on the basis of less evidence than they would otherwise require to substantiate belief, cannot have had much contact with conspiracy theorists. So he's kind of giving and taking at the same time. Yes, he's, he is doing a kind of guilt by association with respect to particular conspiracy theories, but also pointing out that many of the people who complain about conspiracy theories don't seem to know much about what conspiracy theorists actually say or indeed do. Mm. So he quickly moves on to talk about um, the problem that conspiracy theories appear to form the core of degenerating research programs. That what was old lakatosh. Mm. That was a, a term that came up in the abstract. Um, and this is drawing the comparison between conspiracy theories and scientific theories. Um, a degenerating research program in science, as he, as he puts it, in a, in a degenerating research program, successful novel predictions and retrodictions, not a word I've encountered before, but I like it. Uh, predictions and retrodictions are not made. Instead, auxiliary hypotheses and initial conditions are successively modified in light of new evidence to protect the original theory from apparent disconfirmation. Now, for people listening at home, a retrodiction essentially is a prediction about the past, and sometimes we talk about those as being able to explain phenomena that has already occurred. So not just predicting new and novel phenomena, but coming up with an explanation of something which you're already going... I'm puzzled about this thing. Oh, we can retrodictively explain that now. Right. So it's not it's not brewed then at all. Well, not it, a, it is not a in amongst certain company. Right. Okay. Uh, I'm going to really retrodict you tonight. Yes, I was going to say, I enjoy a bit of retro. I enjoy a bit of retrodiction now. Um, so does this tie into the business about falsification? Yes and no. I mean, so there's a kind of interesting double standard here, I think, which is that Steve agrees with Brian that falsificationism is not a good way to demarcate between a conspiracy theory and some other kind of theory, because it turns out the problem with falsificationism, apart from the fact that it's actually not a good standard for demarcating being good or, good or bad theories anyway, is that in the sciences, things like the electrons don't lie about their superposition, whilst people involved in conspiracies are likely to be mis misleading you. So we shouldn't be using a criteria from the sciences to demarcate between good theories and bad theories about conspiracy, collusions, cover-ups, and the like. I think it's kind of weird to then go, but this other contentious theory about the way the sciences work, that could apply in this particular case, because if you're not aware, talk about scientific research programs or paradigms, so Lakatosh or, God, now I've forgotten his name. I want Kuhn. Well, I, I always could call him Thomas Hume, Thomas Kuhn. These are contentious explanations for A, how scientific change occurs, and B, what makes a good theory versus a bad theory. So for Lakatosh, we have this particular notion that if your scientific research program is in a degenerative state, so you're basically just trying to shore it up against evidence which is mounting against it, then your theory is probably bad, although not necessarily so, because there are examples of degenerating programs that have been rescued late in life and been shown to be good after all anyway. But I just don't think if you're going to discard one particular bad demarcation between good or bad theories, it's appropriate to bring in another demarcating criteria 
from the sciences to something which is definitely in the realm of the social sciences instead. Mm. So this brings us into section three, Unwarranted Conspiracy Theories, where he actually starts um, pulling apart Brian's work and looking at this, the, the, this idea of unwarranted conspiracy theories that he first brought up. Um, to me, reading this, I, I, I found myself reading through the section thinking he wasn't giving a, a fair or accurate summary of, of Brian's views in some places. Possibly that's me getting things wrong. I am, I am merely a, a, an enthusiastic amateur in these matters, these days anyway. Um, but so he, he gives a summary of the conditions that Brian put forward for what counts as an unwarranted conspiracy theory um, and sort of does a little bit of a, a little bit of surgery on the paper and that he sort of he, he lists the the characteristics that Brian himself set forth which we talked about a few uh, instances ago of conspiracy theory masterpiece theater um, and then also pulls in uh, Brian talking about the fact that conspiracy theories account for errant data which is sort of which which I remember in the original paper it was sort of that was brought up as a justification for why they sort of like them or want to think they're superior to the official version because they account for this errant data. The this paper kind of makes it, this paper seemed to make the assumption that accounting for errant data was another necessary characteristic of unwarranted conspiracy theories, and that that didn't quite ring true to me. No, no. I mean, errant data can be used, whether you're talking about errant data which is contrary or errant data which is contradictory. And Steve is right to point out that this data does appear in other types of explanations. And if Keeley denied that, that would be an issue. But as you say, it's actually not clear at all that Brian is of the opinion that errant data is solely the domain of the conspiracy theory. Because by definition, errant data is data which is errant to some rival explanations. It's actually built into Keeley's work that, yes, conspiracy theories will use data which is errant to the official theory. In the same respect, the official theory is likely to cite data which is errant to some conspiracy theory. Mm. Um, so, in, so in this paper, Steve, he argues against... Um, Keeley's formulation, Keeley's definition, I suppose, of unwarranted conspiracy theories, he reckons that the, um, the, the criteria that he puts up are neither necessary nor sufficient to properly define an unwarranted conspiracy theory, and um, talks about the fact of errant data, where, yeah, l later on, there's the quote, <clears throat> Keeley is right that social data is generally less reliable than the data that natural scientists locate, but he fails to inform us as to why this consideration should tell particularly against the errant data that conspiracy theories explain. It appears to be a consideration that tells equally against all social data. And I was like, yeah, I didn't think that was, I didn't think he was saying errant data is something that only conspiracy theories deal with. It's just that it is a thing that um, comes up in, in a lot of them. Now, a more telling complaint might be Keeley on that kind of totalitizing skepticism. Mm. Yeah, so basically Steve, Steve argues, uh, if you recall from Brian's paper, he, he said that while falsification may not be a problem, the biggest problem with these unwarranted conspiracy theories is the level of skepticism that they can end up um, causing that you end up as, as the conspiracy theory grows and you're sort of forced to say oh, if, um, these well, these people must have been in on it and if they were in it and then these people must have been in on it and these people must have been in on it to explain how all these people who presumably would have had to have known about it didn't spill the beans and in a worst case scenario you end up being completely skeptical of absolutely everything um, Steve says that this isn't really the case he um, he does he talks about um, Watergate uh, didn't lead anyone to question whether or not uh, the platypus is a mammal. I thought a platypus was a monotreme. Is a monotreme a type of mammal? I'm not sure. That is a good question. I have no. Don't they lay eggs? Anyway, that, wh whatever it is, um, whatever you believe about the Watergate conspiracy theories would not cause you to doubt the taxonomy of uh, the platypus. And he sort of he even comes up with sort of what, okay, so imagine Nixon specifically had some sort of a beef and okay. oh, nope. hello. Nope. Hello, so I'm I'm still in I'm still in here. But yeah. 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 That that that's all right. 
yeah, I'm just, I'm just have, having a meeting. Yeah, right. Okay. Thank you. Is that security or cleaners? Yeah, Sec- security, just checking to make Well, that's sure. good. Oh, yes. Mm. Yeah. Mm. I mean, even though I, I ID or anything, so of course, the fact <laughs> that I've been, I've been hell sitting in the offices has been completely skipped by. Anyway. Mm. Anyway. Uh, yes, speaking of security guards not doing their job properly in Watergate and so on. Um, so he sort of, in what seems like a bit of a straw man, really, he sort of says that, yeah, it's silly, you know, Watergate, conspiracy theories around Watergate don't bottom out in you doubting whether or not up is up and down is down and what have you. Um, but then that brings makes me think of, well, hang on, your, your flat earthers have some definite issues with the laws of physics. Um, you David Icke type conspiracy theorists will question the fundamental nature of reality. Um, bringing things a bit more down to earth. The QAnon folks seem willing to believe basically anything Trump says and believe anything they hear to the contradictory is a lie and the people who are are professing it is a liar. So I didn't think that point of his worked as well, although maybe again that's a case of the fact that it was 2002 and such. I mean, it is also the case that I think I think Steve's argument here is it's not the case that all belief in mature conspiracy theories of an unwarranted kind or all belief in a conspiracy theory produced by the generating research program leads to people being skeptical of everything. So yes, you are going to be able to find some examples of where it appears that people who believe a particular conspiracy theory might be able to be persuaded to drink bleach or inject bleach into their system. But the fact that those people do exist doesn't mean that this is a natural consequence of belief in conspiracy theories generally. So if you take it that that is what Brian advocates, and Steve's not the only person to take Brian as making that particular claim, then Steve is right. Actually, it turns out you can believe in conspiracy theories, even really big ones, and still believe in gravity. Mm. That, I think I think that. I suppose yes. Okay. Yeah, I get you. So yeah, if you want to say the problem with these UCTs is that they lead to you being overly skeptical, well, they don't necessarily. Some of them, um, some of them just don't. Yeah. Um, I had a point about the definition of theories, but reading the rest of it, it seems like a little bit of a, a quibble. So I'm just going to skip past that and go on to section four called conspiracy theorists. And I think this is where um, this is where Steve really uh, sets forth his his own position. Um, he says. Instead of attempting to home in on the epistemic flaws of a significant class of conspiracy theories, as Keeley has, I will focus my attention on the cognitive failures of a significant class of conspiracy theorists. Those conspiracy theorists who continue to hold on to conspiracy theories, even when those take on the appearance of forming the core of degenerating research programs. Um, Which it did seem to be that, seemed like what Brian was largely concerned with, these mature... um, unwarranted conspiracy theories that people still cling to. Um, kind of why I think it's kind of weird that Steve is disagreeing with Keeley on this, because I think when we start talking about mature unwarranted conspiracy theories, and we talk about conspiracy theories as the core of a degenerating research program, they are effectively talking about exactly the same... That's what it sounded topic. like, yeah. Yeah, the example of people who persist in believing a particular conspiracy theory or set of theories which are not satisfied by adequate evidence. Mm. Also, there is kind of interesting thing here that he is going, he's going to find the justification as to why intellectuals have a prima facie suspicion of conspiracy theories. You might just go, well, isn't that just post facto reasoning? I mean, why... Can't it just be the case that intellectuals are just wrong? And this is why I think it's interesting that Steve is fisking Brian here and not Charles Pigton. Because Charles Pigton is the one who's going, well, actually, this notion that conspiracy theories are epistemically suspicious is itself a superstition. And we should inter- interrogate that. 
So Charles's response to this kind, kind of paper would be to go, but why do you believe that in the first place? Surely that's the thing that we should actually be interrogating at this particular point in time. Mm. Um, so the what seemed to me to be the, 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 the crux of the whole thing is when Steve says, the factor that I've identified as being common to the thinking of conspiracy theorists who hold on to degenerating research programs is that they commit what social psychologists call the fundamental attribution error. Dun, dun, dun. Mm. So, so this, this, is, this seems to be his claim. It's not that conspiracy theories themselves uh, necessarily have a problem with them. It's that the people who cling to them are committing a, a cognitive fallacy. Fallacy? I guess it's a fallacy, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So what, what is the fundamental attribution you know, I mean, it, error? It, it's a heuristic mistake. So it is a kind of fallacy. It's, just a, it's one which is operating at a level which might be super rational. Mm. Right, so what is the fundamental attribution error? Well, this is according to Wikipedia. It's also known as the correspondence bias or at attribution effect, and it's the tendency for people to underemphasize situational explanations for an individual's observed behavior while overemphasizing dispositional and personality based explanations for their behavior. This effect has been described as the tendency to believe what people do reflects who they are. So in short, if you think that conspiracy theories are dispositional, which is to say that they rely on what people intend, then you tend to view the world as being the product of what people want to bring about. Whereas if you favor explanations which are more situational, they're contextual based upon historical forces, economics, socio-economic status, and the like, then you're more likely to focus on those kind of factors as being the most salient thing to explain some phenomena in, in the world. And historically, this has been seen in history over the course of the 20th and beginning of the 21st century, with people going, actually, through the lens of this particular school, we can reinterpret history. So if, you, if you're a Marxist historian who thinks that history is best explained by class struggle, then you're more likely to produce explanations that emphasize class distinctions. If you're the kind of person who believes in the so-called great men of history thesis, where history is made or forged by great men going about doing great deeds, then you're the kind of person who will cast their explanations with respect to, say, what Stalin did, rather than the socio-economic situation of Soviet Russia at that particular point in time. And so Steve is arguing the problem with conspiracy theorists is that they're much more likely to adhere to a dispositional or intentional style explanation and thus ignore the situational factors which might be a better explanation of that particular phenomenon. And my response to that, as I wrote in my PhD and in my first book, is that there's just no straight contrast between a dispositional and situational explanation. As any given explanation, conspiracy theory or otherwise, is likely to be an example of both. So when we explain the assassination of Julius Caesar, which was the result of a conspiracy, we have an example of an explanation which, when it's fully formed, is both dispositional and situational. It's situational because the situation in Rome is what led to Caesar being able to seize control and also led to his ability to cement control as a popular hero of the people. But it has dispositional factors with respect to certain members of the nobility, the patricians, not liking that and having the disposition to want to get rid of that issue through an assassination. So it turns out most explanations of complex social phenomena are going to be both dispositional and situational. And there's no really good reason to think that conspiracy theories are any more dispositional or less situational than their rivals turn out to be. And what's particularly interesting about this, and we'll get to this when we look at his 2006 article appealing to the fundamental attribution error, was it all a big mistake, is that Steve kind of recognizes that now as well. Mm, okay. We'll get to that in time. We will. Um, 
Yes, so that's what that, that's what he at least in his two thousand and two incarnation, that's what he is wanting to say. He wants to say that the reason why people stick to these um, conspiracy theories that that that, that are a, a degenerative research program, sorry, degenerating research program, is that to give up those uh, theories means you'd ne usually need to abandon a dispositional explanation in favour of a situational explanation. Um, which I guess, I mean, I, I, I remember talking to a co-worker about 9-11 many years ago and him saying he thought it was an inside job and his reason was because it's the sort of thing they'd do. Sort of a, this was a, the, 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 those, those Bush folks, they always wanted something like that. The, the CIA and everything are always meddling and aren't above that sort of, those sort of underhanded dirty tricks. Look at COINTEL Pro from last week. So... His, his 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 thinking was that it was due to the disposition the dispositions of these people are why he believed they would be behind a conspiracy theory um but you're saying that really there's a lot of it you could talk about the disposition of al-qaeda operatives as well and what they wanted and what they were after plus a whole bunch of situational stuff including you know the physical evidence on the ground and the eyewitness footage and so on and so on and so on and so on or the socio economic status that either led to al-Qaeda committing their attack or members of the Bush administration going, we need to find a way to justify war in the Middle East. Hmm. At any rate, so uh, this then moves on to the conclusion, Section 5, Conspiracy Theorizing. So it, it does, um, having sort of, he believes, um, identifying what's wrong with conspiracy theorists, or, or, or if not what's wrong with conspiracy theories, what's wrong with the conspiracy theorists who promote them. Um, he does say that we should at least consider them, even though we know that there is this, um, this uh, that he claims we know there is this cognitive fallacy behind them. Um, so he says, there are several things that can be said in favour of conspiracy theorising. First, the conspiracy theorist challenges us to improve our social explanations. If a non-conspiratorial social explanation is better articulated as a result of the challenge of a conspiracy theory, then that is all to the good. Second, the conspiracy theorist occasionally identifies a genuine conspiracy. Giving a thousand conspiracy theories some consideration is a small price to pay to have one actual nefarious conspiracy, such as the Watergate conspiracy, un uncovered sooner rather than later. And finally, the prevalence of conspiracy theories confers a third benefit upon us, which is that it helps to maintain openness in society. Now, so it's important to note, and he does note this in section four, as well as reiterates it in section five, he's not so much, again, conspiracy theories. He's concerned about conspiracy theorists. So he does want to say that conspiracy theories are a class of explanation, which needs to be assessed with respect to the evidence. The issue is the promotion of particular conspiracy theorists, sorry, particular conspiracy theories by particular conspiracy theorists. So his interest very much is on the people promoting the theories, not the content of the theories themselves. And I think that's important to note because I think Steve often gets categorized as being kind of a generalist when it comes to talk about conspiracy theories and belief in such theories. But I think he is actually articulating a particularist agenda here. He's just really concerned about the people who promote or advocate conspiracy theories. Now, I think that worry is misplaced because I think it works on an entirely pejorative gloss of who counts as being a conspiracy theorist. So I take it from this particular kind of paper, Steve is not going to agree with Charles that we're all conspiracy theorists of some particular stripe, but Steve is of the opinion we should still appraise conspiracy theories with respect to the evidence. He's concerned about the degenerating ones being promoted by the wrong kind of conspiracy theorist. Mm. And I did, I, I had a bit of trouble following it th right the way through, um, just because, like, as, as I think perhaps you saw with Brian's paper a little bit, there are 
very clearly starts off talking about unwarranted conspiracy theories or conspiracy theories that form the core of a degenerating research program. But then towards the end, he's just using the phrase conspiracy theory unadorned the whole way through, and it kind of makes it sound like he's talking about them in blanket terms when, as you say, prob probably actually not. Mm. Um, but it does, yeah, re reading this one and some of the other ones we've looked at, it does seem that th there seems to be a bit of a theme of people, people tying themselves in knots a little bit because they want to be able to say, the, here is this class of things that we want to agree are all silly, and yet that never really quite seems to work out, and so I can understand why, why then others will say, well, actually, maybe we need to look at that assumption. Um, maybe we shouldn't just be, we, 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 we shouldn't allow ourselves the luxury of saying that here's this class of things that we can immediately, if not discount, then be sceptical of right from the start. Free Hmm. Well, there you have it. So we've, we, we're up to 2002. Um, this is our, what, fourth? Fourth one we've looked at. We did Charles, then Brian, then Lee, then this. Indeed. Yes. So there we go. So we're, we're rocketing through them. How, how big is the field these days? Like, are we going to run out of papers to look at anytime soon? So when I was writing my PhD starting... 2008 finishing 2012 there are probably about 12 to 14 papers in general there has there has been somewhat of an explosion in the literature subsequent to that so we're probably going to be able to keep this up for well over well actually pro probably almost a year if not slightly longer. I haven't actually made a, a complete count. Mm. We have the issue that we not only have articles, we have book chapters that we can look at as well. And if we include book chapters, then we should be able to go on this for at least two years. Goodness me. Maybe we need to do a bit of an edited highlights as we go on further. I don't know. We'll see. It's all it's a grand adventure. Pre previously on Conspiracy Theory Masterpiece Theatre. Mm. Yes, well, we're all just making it up as we go anyway. Um, now, next week, let me look well, at my calendar. Yes. Uh, no, I mean, next week, just to talk about uh, the patron bonus episode, this might be our final episode, because next week is, my, is apparently the main doomsday. Apparently we got that date completely wrong, and the world is ending next week. So this may well be our final episode. Mm. Well, Josh continues to look at his calendar, and I don't know why he's bothered. I was just wanting to see whether, whether next week is the last week, which means next week will be a news episode, and it is. Um, and we will talk about things such as what's going to be coming up in the bonus content. If indeed the bonus talk about. content turns out to be false, which mm. is interesting. If there's a news episode next week, then the news about next week is wrong. Mm. Curious. But also we'll be talking about how the Trump campaign has threatened to sue CNN over a poll they didn't like. We've got an update on Tupac Shakur, which isn't really much of an update at all, but, you know, mm -hmm. we're bringing up. And we'll be talking about that SS tattoo that was on a Las Vegas police officer, which turned out to not be on a police officer at all. Mm. Mysterious. But if you want to know more, you'll need to be a patron. If you are a patron, thank you very much. We appreciate you greatly. If you'd like to be a patron, you can go to Patreon and look for the Podcaster's Guide to the Conspiracy, or you can go to conspiracism.podbean.com and use Podbean's uh, native native patronage system, however the heck that works. Um, and if you don't want to be a patron, that's fine. We're, we're, we're quite happy that you've chosen to listen to us today. Uh, but that is all for today. That is all for today, isn't it? It is all for today. In that case, uh, I suppose then really we should just, just, just say goodbye? Do a bit of the old goodbyeing? Well, you say goodbye, I say murder she wrote. Very well. Goodbye. Murder she wrote. Hmm. You've been listening to the podcaster's Guide to the Conspiracy, starring Josh Addison and Dr. M.R.X. Dentit. 
which is written, researched, recorded, and produced by Josh and M. You can support the podcast by becoming a patron via its Podbean or Patreon campaigns. And if you need to get in contact with either Josh or M, you can email them at podcastconspiracy at gmail.com or check their Twitter accounts, Monkey Fluids and Conspiracism. Thank you.